Hello everyone and welcome back to Refinitive Perspectives Live. Today we will be talking about the transformation of trading for the sell side in a post-COVID world. I herefore want to welcome Ian Mosley from the LSEC, our Head of Equity, and also Midan Gabby, Chief Revenue Officer at Quad Financial. Welcome to the both of you and thank you for joining our Refinitive Perspectives Live. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks. I'm just going to uh, directly start with the first uh, question that we're having. Um, I mean, we hear a lot about the sell side going through uh, disruption. Maybe, uh, Ian, you can give us a little overview on um, or a little bit more details about what the challenges are that we are facing uh, in this situation. Yeah, thank you. Um, so welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Good morning. Um, definitely appreciate everybody's attendance today. Um, so yes, I'm Ian Maudsley. I look after equities for EMEA. And I also look after the sell side order management system business at uh, LSEC, data and analytics, formerly known as Refinitiv. So a uh, great question to start with, I think. Um, it's definitely what has brought us to this point and certainly um, the, the partnership that we have with Quad Financial in particular. I think there's been um, you know, a number of changes in, in our business over the last few years. And we definitely saw a huge shift about two years ago uh, on the buy side, uh, predominantly driven, I think, through MIFID II and changes of regulation. Lots of new market structure came in and, and you know, the buy side EMS and OMS space went under a massive disruption. Some players departed as the new players came in. It almost felt like you know, the, the, the status quo was left on the sell side to a certain extent. There, there really didn't seem to be much changes going on. I think it's clear there's one very dominant force, one very dominant party within that particular business it was kind of been left untouched to a certain extent. I think post that, those sort of changes in MIFID II, um, we're, we're sort of seeing the same sort of shift now on the sell side. Uh, a lot of it's been driven by cost, I guess. Uh, I think people are having a general review around, you know, where cost lies. And a large part of that is around water management systems in particular, particularly those legacy uh, on-site, very heavy enterprise delivered solutions that have, that have been out there for the last 20 years, maybe 25 years in, in some cases. Uh, and obviously, you know, some of the, the data and the connectivity costs that are associated with that. So I think all of that, that is under review. Probably along the journey as, as we've come in the last couple of years is also been a shift in, in market competition and a shift in some of the players as well. We, we've seen a de departure or the announced departure of, of Bloomberg Seals products. Um, we've seen the acquisition of Fidesa, which is the, the, the industry store, if you like, by the Ion Group. Uh, and just a few fringe players as well, some buy side operators that are trying to take their technology and shift it to the buy side. So, so generally with our business here, a lot of the, the players are changing around a little bit. And I think when that happens, I think the industry itself takes a little bit of an introspective look and starts saying, okay, if there's change going on, should we be part of it? What is that change? And what does it actually mean for us? So I think that that's where the industry is at right now. I think pretty much everybody within our business is, is probably taking a look at its desktop trading strategy and working out, am I with the right partner, vendor partner? Um, you know, has it, are they delivering me the right type of technology solution? What are the challenges that are out in front of me today? And I think everybody is now, over the next two to three years, I'd be very surprised there won't be many players that are probably in some form of RFP process. Ian, I, I think one of the, the big challenges that the industry has really faced is this explosion that's happened on the buy side. Uh, also, the importance of TCA, the pressure that the buy side are putting directly on their brokers to make improvements, but inversely, that lack of investment, where there really hasn't been an opportunity for the sell sides who are slow moving anyway to really be able to reinvest in their technologies. So what you end up with is a, a cost saving exercise. And I don't think anyone in a, in a sell side trading desk would really put their hand up and say, yeah, we've been heavily invested in over the last couple of years. So you have fewer staff, you have systems that are, are really designed to handle problems uh, from five, at least five to 10 years ago. And as you're using these systems, you have an increased order flow, you have an increased client base, you've had people stepping out of sell side. You look at Commerce Bank or Deutsche Bank's recent example, even Macquarie have stepped out of equities. You've suddenly got that flow being redirected to different brokers. The pressure's on them to look at the TCA and the analytics and prove that they're doing better executions, prove that they're uh, working better for the buy side. And, and really the solution, the transformative solution that the industry is facing is to try and move towards some kind of automation. How can I do more with less 
at lower cost. And, and I think that was what really drove the original partnership when we were speaking with Refinitiv many, many years ago, was uh, a data provider, an order management systems provider, and an execution management provider. How can we use this wealth of data to move towards more effective automation while still allowing the sell side to differentiate and, and prove that they are doing the job that the buy side are expecting of them? Yeah, I was uh, just gonna say the uh, partnership that uh, you have built there. What uh, when it started, or what was like the the first um, idea out of that partnership, and what is it changing right now, or what changes have been made right now? Also, looking at the um, trading behavior changes, and probably also a couple of details throughout the the whole uh, pandemic. Maybe uh, you have a couple of details here for us. Yeah, do, you, do you want to pick up the partnership point for a start? So um, I think what was interesting for us is that you know, with our trading team of what was Refinitiv now, LSEG, you know, we've got some incredibly powerful tools. Uh, we're, we're very specialized on the buy side, I think, when it comes to equities. On the sell side, you know, we're probably market leading when it comes to uh, the FX products, particularly our electronic trading product, which I think has you know, sort of captured that tier two, tier three type market for, for liquidity provision there. Our FX all product, I've yeah, got a 30 something market percent share in the FX space. But what seemed to be missing, which was a little odd for me, was the fact that we didn't really have any equity trading tools actually on the sell side. And it's kind of ironic because when you look at particularly the combined organization of what was Refinitiv and now LSEG, you know, we probably have a relationship with just about every major bank or broker that's on the street. You know? So we're providing some kind of service to them. And certainly on the Refinitiv side, when we started this, you know, we looked and said, we're, we're putting data into just about every major bank and broker. We've got our Autex trade route network, which just about every major bank or broker is connected on there. We've got a ton of people that are using our desktop services. They're using our KYC services. There's just all this periphery stuff. And, and somewhere in the middle, it was going somewhere. And I don't think we ever really asked that question to ourselves. Like, what happens to this data? You know, when we, when we stick it into a bank or a broker, where's it going? What is it actually doing? I just don't think we ever got to that point. And I think eventually what was interesting for us was we acquired a buy side OMS, Alphadesk, maybe about two and a bit years ago. And it, and it sort of kicked off a number of conversations with people saying, great, you've bought an OMS. Can we take you into this bank? Can we take you into that broker? And of course, you know, we had to have a little bit of an education session for our own sales team to say, look, look yes, it's an OMS, but, but the buy side OMS is obviously playing a very different role. It's more portfolio management with order routing as opposed to what we classically think of an order management system. But, you know, when you get like a dozen of those inbound conversations from your sales team, at some stage the light bulb goes off and you say, well, hang on a second. You know, these guys are asking us, you know, have you got something? And can I plug my data feed into it? And we're having to say no, no, no. So, you know, then you've got to go and look and say, right, okay, we need to be in this space. You, you, you can't just build an order management system overnight. It takes years, right? And the quad guys will tell you that. They show me now and talk about, you know, how long the guys have been working on this. You know, it's not only the the number of years that, that, that they've been in operation themselves you know the team that runs quad have probably been doing this for the best part of 30 something years right so the, the, that's why you can't buy that you can't build it and, and ultimately you've got to look and say if you really want to play properly in this space you've got to come with something that's not only market leading it's also bringing something that's a little bit different it's it's, it's just going to differentiate and make people move away from their incumbent systems so when we did the due diligence and the partnership yeah quad were the only people that, that we looked at that really had just something that was different on the desktop, just grabbed your attention from the get-go. And the interesting thing for, for us was they had experience of working with our products, so they knew our data. They built lots of their products around RICs. They've worked with our connectivity solutions. You know, it was almost a, a marriage that was made for us to a certain extent. Uh, and you know, I think quite a, a very typical of, of uh, a lot of tech companies that are out there that build great products. But that cost of go-to-market, again, is something that Again, the opposite is true. It takes years and lots of money to go and build those distribution networks, right? And if you look at what was Refinitiv, you know, got 500 account managers and salespeople. Add all of the LSEG reps into that as well. You know, you're talking about one of the biggest global distribution networks. So us having the ability to take their product to market, I think, is, as I say, is a bit of a marriage that was sort of almost laid out for us. I think one of the interesting challenges that you get in, in any technology company um, when you're purely focused on one product and have been, as Ian said, for the last 15 years. Um, the vision uh, right from the founding of the company, and, and actually if you go all the way back to 2004, we were originally part of Reuters, uh, there was an innovation lab and we did an MBO to, to take this technology and bring it to market. 
uh, the view was always to drive automated trading. I mean, our, our mantra is how can you use automated trading? How could we further the low touch business and the use of algos? Um, to a certain extent, 15 years ago, the industry wasn't even ready for that. Uh, it was uh, really the bleeding edge to bring automation uh, in and finding partners on the scale of Refinitiv um, is not only a challenge, but you need to find partners who are not just looking to uh, simply deliver, for example, terminals or working on traditional business. You really want partners who are looking to innovate. And I think that was, uh, as we said before, the, the first part of the approach uh, was that Refinitiv very much focused on the uh, on the data business and how they can use this data to drive uh, innovation in every part of the of the product stack. They also had a lot of experience in absorbing technologies and integrating them into their wider business. And obviously, we're in production with an awful lot of clients. Um, so it, it, it was a perfect partnership. It's a perfect opportunity in the market to provide end to end solutions. We are going all the way from data provision all the way through to the end clients and encompassing all of this on desk automation, algos and, and trading. So it really works very well. Obviously, we get to the end as well. <laughs> I mean, you, you've mentioned, mentioned automation already, and uh, we have to talk about workflows, mentioning uh, automation, data sets, feeds, APIs, not just desktop solutions, which is obviously also something that you, you cannot ignore that more and more companies and even banks are moving into the direction of making things simpler, more efficient and quicker, obviously, as well. So, um, Thinking about um, that base and the changes that have been made already, um, what role do you think uh, remote trading will continue to play and mean also for the traders' uh, trading infrastructure, let's say, and uh, specifically that workflows that might have or are changing? So uh, one of the things that I, I, I have seen is that the pandemic, the shift towards remote trading, and even to a certain extent Brexit, hasn't been as impactful on trading desks as they thought. Uh, I know a lot of banks, a lot of brokers, a lot of buy side that we work with were quite fearful of the concept of promoting remote working, promoting distributed offices, um, partly because it separated the trading teams, but also the moment you're breaking apart those trading teams, you're losing a lot of the support tools that those traders have to do their jobs effectively. And the, the remote working, the post-pandemic world also ties in with the role of the OEMS and the data provider, which is making tools accessible to the traders, allowing them to manage their workflows more effectively. Uh, you know, I, I sometimes speak with traders on the desks and they say, which programming language do you think I need to learn in order to automate my, my, my job or order to in integrate with my systems, whether it's via API or for, uh, via various TCA tools? And the answer is you shouldn't have to, you should not have to do that. The tools being provided to you should give you a depth of access to intimate, uh, information, to automation. And, and that's really something that remote working is promoting. Um, but I think that was a pre-pandemic activity as, as people were shifting towards using these tools better. And, and EMS, OMS vendors have been looking to provide these tools to the traders as well. Well, to make access, uh, well, easier, understandable, and maybe quicker to to, uh, digest more or less in a in a sense probably yeah understand um also um thinking about uh, the the challenges in that point uh, I mean you've you've mentioned the the positive side of it and then also the positive uh, facts that came uh, or already started before the pandemic because there was a change of uh, thinking the mindset uh, new ideas getting you know becoming more and more creative because of everything we have you know offer the digitalization and and uh, tools uh, that allow us to think in an even more easy and still very efficient way um, what challenges do you see within that setup what I mean I don't want to say negative things but um, let's say challenges uh, are coming with that and what, what have you maybe seen or experienced yourself Ian I don't know if you want to take that one yeah, no, I mean, I, I, some of the, the some of the challenges that obviously come up, I think, are around. You know, we're in a regulated business, and you know, you thought about this, even sort of pre-pandemic, the idea of, of shifting trading operations into somebody's bedroom, 
which is effectively what we're talking about. You know, people would have screamed and gone crazy, and uh, you know, I just can't possibly imagine the conversations. Um, I, I think not only have we shown that it, it can be done. Um, I think what it has shown, though, is, is that there are can do's and can't do and, and, and can't cannot do's, if you like. So certain systems, I think, one have been set up so that they can actually have remote access. You know, so those that have got the ability to go and use the internet to be able to go and um, you know put a, a trading desktop onto somebody's laptop or a home computer, whatever it is, um, not everybody can do that. You know, so, so an awful lot of the, the incumbent systems, you know, require you to be on a very dedicated machine and require you to be in an internal network. You know, that's one. Two, then you got to think about, you know, compliance, risk management, those sort of things, and not having those sort of um, administrative tools, again, that need to be accessed remotely because now the risk manager, the operations manager, yeah, they're also sitting in their daughter's bedroom trying to manage a business, right? So I think that that's the, 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 can, the, have, the haves and have nots is probably how I should be explaining it. I think I've used my wrong expression there, right? But I think that that's, uh, that's what set one of the things apart. I think one of the in other interesting uh, elements that's come out of the whole sort of remove to remote trading, um, and it's not directly related to a sort of change of business, but maybe a change of workflow, is um, there's been a lot more retail or self-directed time trading. And, and you know, if you look at US equities, I, I saw a report just recently that said, you know, like a year ago, you were looking at about single digits, five, six percent probably of total US equity flow was, was by retail traders. More recently, there was something like 25 percent one day was recently executed by, by retail traders. You know, there's all these great Reddit board stories, GameStop, all of these sort of stuff that's fueling, um, you know, that that sort of fear of missing out to a certain extent. I think also just generally, right, people are realizing, look, I'm at home. I've got more time on my hands. Um, I've maybe got money that I'm not spending on commuting into a city somewhere and having to pay £10 for a sandwich every single day. Perhaps I'm going to go and stick this into a trading account. But that's brought a challenge because uh, an awful lot of auto management systems, again, are one, not set up to take that type of flow. So first of all, if you're kind of trying to redirect your business model, you know, you may not have the appropriate tools. But secondly, just that additional number of logins, those number of orders that are smaller orders, they, they have a different impact on the back end of the system. And so all of a sudden, you know, as, a, as an order management system, you're just dealing with a whole bunch of challenges that you just were not set out for a year ago. And we're sitting that right now, and Amida and I are both in, God, I, I can't think of how many joint pitches at the moment where, you know, what we would have seen as traditional agency firms are now having a discount or a retail brokerage arm as well. Um, you know, not asking us and sort of saying, can you cope with these type of retail flurries? What sort of front end tools have you got? What sort of APIs? Have you got access to it? If I've got my own web-based trading tool, you know, have you got the right API that I can just plug and play this thing and, and use your system? And it's suddenly like showing up some of these old legacy systems. As I said, they, they just were not prepared for this. None of us saw it. It's a change that I think is here to stay. It's not going to go away. I think retail trading is going to be around for a little bit longer. And yeah, and it really puts the pressure back on the desk and back on the trader. How do I do the job that I was doing a year ago, but now with double the volume? And a lot of those trades are trades which I can't necessarily add a lot of value to. So I, I need them to be handled, but I need them to not impact my ability to actually do the core business that I was I've been doing for the last ten or fifteen years. Yet suddenly I have this uh, this this mist of all of these trades that I'm I'm having to try and process. So it, it is a challenge, and and it is something that obviously uh, we're we're uh, offering to try and solve. Um, when when we're talking about uh, those uh, changes, and you mentioned the challenges now also, and the the workflows, um, how are uh, AI and ML, as well as I mean other new technologies, uh, working themselves into these uh, cell side workflows that you just mentioned? Um, so for us, and, and I can only really talk about our experiences in the market, uh, but we see two key areas where we are actively putting into production artificial intelligence and machine learning. And there's a lot of hype around those, those terms. And, and a big aspect that you need to consider is where am I getting the data from? How am I using my client data to deliver this? How are we managing this whole process? Uh, for us, we believe the two most practical things that you can do in an OEMS is a vendor. Um, one of them, we talk about parameter optimization. So a trader has, uh, for example, a TCA output that's been given to him by a buy side. And it says maybe the trade didn't perform as well as he might have intended. The question becomes, what can he actually do to identify this situation happening in the future? How can he improve that? 
And the EMSs are so complicated. You know, we have 500 plus configurable parameters just on our smart order router. Even if you look at a specific algo being offered by the brokers, you can have a range of parameters for aggressivity, you know, numbered zero to 10. How do I know a mid cap stock on a Tuesday, if I change it from seven to four, I'm gonna get a better result. So the pressure comes onto the trading desk. Here's TCA, generate a better result, what can I do? And using machine learning, we can provide this real-time feedback, this back-testing approach of what market conditions are we actually looking at in this stock and how can we make a recommendation in real-time to the trader. So not automating uh, the execution itself, but just providing that feedback directly to the trader to say, look, this is perhaps a solution to this problem. So that's parameter optimization. Then on the other side, you've actually got machine learning and algos. So peg offsets, predicting micro volatility events. So these are the two areas we're really focused, augmenting the individual algos with machine learning and historic data, um, and then providing that feedback directly to traders in the front end to say, in these conditions, perhaps try not just an algo wheel, not just this algo, but within this algo, how can I configure it? Um, yeah, no, I mean, first of all, I, I think you kind of made a great expression, right? There's a lot of hype. Um, and, and I love, you know, I spend a lot of time our data science team or our labs team, um, you know, because we have a lot of those. There we go, gone. Hopefully you can still hear me. Um, yeah, look, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of hype, and, and AI in particular, I think if you probably think about people's classic definitions of what AI is, I don't think any of us are actually doing that or, or talking about it. It is using machine learning techniques. You know, we're a data company first and foremost, and I think that we know that this area, if you like, is going to be our new battleground, that there's no two ways about it, right? Just the the distribution of data, giving somebody data is no longer going to be sufficient, right? People want to be actually understanding how can I make a meaningful use of the data? You know, what tools are you going to provide me that make that easier? You know, even maybe for some of the smaller firms that don't have access to their own data science teams, you know, they are looking for, for, for productized. I think that's quite difficult to go and do. Um, we've discussed that in-house in, in terms of, you know, building an actual product around machine learning, it, it seems pretty difficult, right? Because everybody's got their own interpretation of what they want the output of those data points to go and be. But for sure, trade performance analytics and the use of those, your trading data, as I say, is going to be the area that, that's the new battleground, not just for, for the sell side, for the buy side as well. It is, it's tough to go and do. I, I, you know, we, we have been asked a lot of our data science teams. And what we do realize is that the market structure and some of the changes particularly happened under MIFID 2 are probably not played into making all of that data points useful, there's a lot of hidden points of liquidity. Right? So there's addressable, non-addressable liquidity. And when you're trying to build these models that, that are meant to be assisting people in making better execution decisions, you're going to have to start making some assumptions about what's out there because you can't actually see the entire picture until it's until it's executed, in which case it's too late. So there's definitely a, a lot of challenges. Um, we, we'll, we'll, but for sure, I think that there's no company out there that isn't right now looking at the analytics space is looking at machine learning techniques and is looking at automation in particular bringing all that together and either presenting as i say as some kind of end product or presenting it as a toolkit which probably makes just that little bit more sense to me particularly as again you know we, we talked about at the beginning but the front office guys are becoming more educated in things like python um and and you know the ability to actually go and use data i, I think there's the days of picking up a telephone and pressing a button on a machine as a sales trader are long, long gone behind us. And, and they are definitely expected to be taking part in this, doing less is more, as Midan alluded to earlier on. And, and to do that, they've got to go and learn the skill set to, to be able to help themselves as they help their company. I think there's also an element of trust uh, that is far behind the technology that's available. And it's not just about the traders or the trading desk trusting the use of automation, the use of machine learning, uh, or even just simply the use of algos, but it's also the buy side, um, where we have you know, a, a wide menu of different algos in different settings. Sometimes we're being asked by the end client of our customers to print in the market, simply to reassure them that the algo is doing something. And it's not just waiting there for some future event. And when the customer turns around to the trader and says, okay, well, what's it gonna do next? It's very difficult to respond with, well, I don't actually know, but I'm pretty sure it's going to give you a better benchmark against a rival price. So there's this benefit um, and, and process that, that has to happen where everyone has to gain trust 
Uh, and then data is a huge part of that as well, making sure data is available to the end clients, making sure the analytics is available and giving them confidence. And this is key that if something goes wrong, you actually have the ability to fix it because the client wants to feel him. Sorry. No, I just got to play into that. I, know, I think a little bit of self-promotion here to a certain extent. You know, what you're talking about is very, very key, right? And then to make those tools work, you need to have access to quality data, right? And it's it's not a question of you can't afford to skip tick updates. Um, you can't afford any delays on the delivery mechanism of that. You can't, you know, if you're really looking at a sort of global model as well, you can't afford to pick and choose which, which markets you're going to be uh, delivering on. You know, it needs to be a holistic solution. If, if I'm looking about what, the area that we're sort of providing a, some sort of advantage to quad empowering the tools that they've got i think one it, it is the quality of data it's the breadth of our data and again you just alluded to at the end of it is always just servicing that data as well yeah, let's be honest right both software data delivery all of these things they're going to go wrong at some stage right that's just an inevitable fact of life facebook goes down and microsoft crashes every now and again you know these are companies that you'd expect to have zero zero downtime everybody is going to have points of failure the key to making all of this work, right, is how do you back that up? You know, what sort of service function have you got sitting behind that? And that's where an organization such as uh, Refinitiv, and also Refinitiv, you know, we've got a huge operation that, that sits behind this. And the ability to make sure that our systems are up and running and delivering quality data the whole time is definitely, I think, what sets us apart for the crowd as we come into these more data-driven type models. Well, that, that extends also into the whole global, globalization aspect. So part of remote working is not just about enabling traders to work remotely. It's potentially opening new markets, um, whether that's moving into emerging markets or unifying and consolidating. We talk about consolidation from a quad point of view. We're obviously a multi-asset product, so it goes across all asset classes. But what you en then end up doing is looking at a project that is simultaneously unifying, uh, whether it's U.S. and London and Tokyo, uh, but also including... Uh, Russia, South Africa, you know, we're bringing these desks together and from a data and servicing point of view, um, from a fixed network, from a client perspective, it's all very well delivering a global OMS solution, but you also need global partnerships, global data, global connectivity. So that's absolutely critical for us. Um, I, I mean, I was uh, just about, it looks like you, you already gave me the answer, but just to make it clear, because everything you, you mentioned also, Ian, uh, just before, to reduce uh, trading costs, to free up the traders time and to focus on the more complex um, orders where you probably or most likely really need a bit more um, time for and be more concentrated for to avoid um, not uh, enoughly automated uh, workflows and to process to, or to minimize uh, slippage and things like that um, is the key really uh let's say just it sounds so easy that's why i'm just trying to figure out where the details uh, are hiding in in all this because you mentioned that the key to probably all that is to have um a, a global approach to um get a partner that is set up globally to get someone who um, provides the setups that are not just focused on desktops and then that one or two or three four licenses so maybe you have you know a couple of yeah last words to to wrap this more or less up for everyone listening here as well look it, it's simple you just buy quad fine for me <laughs> ian what <laughs> um yeah i mean we we've as i said before it, it's going to be a massive change we, we're seeing the change right now it, it's huge um, I, I don't think we could have got our timing any better on this. In fact, you know, I'm going to say we struck a little bit lucky between the two of us. I don't think when we actually entered into this conversation, we've probably been talking for the best part of 18 months, two years around this, you know, and I think we dilly dallied a little bit at the beginning of it. And, you know, we saw, as I said, some of the industry changes that were going on. But, but, but the last year has just changed the landscape so dramatically for us. And just both of us are just in pole position right now. You know, just all the things that we've talked about, um, you know, the, the move to automation, it definitely very, very key, right? This, I, I can't emphasize this doing less with more. I love the fact that Midan led in with that because it's such a, it's a key word, or key phrase that I use internally quite regularly with our, with our sales and account management team. Yeah, people, I, it, it, the flip side of this is, by the way, I keep, you know, people talk about the death of the sales trader or the death of the broker, that, that, that's not going to happen, right? At the end of the day, there is a real need and necessity to have 
somebody who's specialized in handling a high touch order, somebody that, that, that's been around, got experience of markets in difficult, volatile market conditions. You know, algos can play a part because keep in mind that generally they're going to go and follow a pattern. Right? And when you're in uh, extreme markets and, you know, they're, they're slightly directionless in a certain extent, having the ability to have somebody who's got a head on their shoulders and can make those human decisions, that's very, very key. But what is true, there's going to be less of those people around. And as Mida says before, there's more and more orders, there's more and more different types of customers. The buy side continues to grow. The retail segment continues to grow. Wealth, we haven't even talked about wealth management. You know, that, that's a massively growing area. They've all got to go filter their orders through these brokers. They've all got to go filter their orders through order management systems on the way to exchanges. Uh, but at the same time, there just isn't that amount of investment dollars that, that sits within the sell side to go, go and take care of all of that with the existing structure it is today, right? So the challenge is right now is, as I say, you know, how do I, how do I cut out costs? How do I get a lighter technology footprint? And how do I automate more of my world of flow? How do I just give a better service to my customers from the high and low touch perspective? And I say to the two of us, I think we're in a great position to do that. Uh, Miren, I don't want to cut uh, off. So if no, you have no. some last words, except for buy. No, I, I just <clears throat> totally agree with totally agree with Ian. Obviously, there's a fantastic opportunity. Yeah. Everything's come together at the right time, and and we're really pleased to be able to serve our existing customers, and obviously looking forward to having new conversations. So thank you, thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us, and thanks uh, for spending that time and to discuss these these things with our audience also together. I mean, there are a couple of questions that came in. We're probably gonna shoot them back to you. So thanks for um, spending that time and hopefully talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Appreciate the time. Thank you. If you enjoyed today's episode and would like to request more details about Refinitiv's equity and stock trading platforms, you can do so by scanning the QR code that you just see here in the screen. And uh, of course, follow the link just posted in the comments uh, for next updates. And I'm hoping to see you all soon. Thanks for joining.